crimes on unsolved mysteries. He was called the Green Beret Killer and sentenced to multiple life terms for killing his wife and two children. More than three decades after the crime, Jeffrey McDonald still says that he's innocent and he claims to have the evidence to prove it. A nine-year-old girl is abducted from her own home. One year later, she places a frantic call to police. Could she still be alive? And a young mother is devastated by the death of her newborn baby girl. Then she uncovers clues that her daughter may actually be alive. Five stories. They're all strange, but they are all true. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Gallup, New Mexico lies within what was once the territory of the Navajo Indian Nation. One April day, this quiet community of 20,000 was rocked by the mysterious disappearance of a nine-year-old Navajo girl, Anthonette Cayadito. When her mother and two sisters woke up that morning, they were surprised to find that Anthonette was not in the house. We went looking for around the house, nothing. I didn't start panicking until we checked with all the neighbors, went to every house, and nobody had seen her. The police and Penny's neighbors searched the surrounding foothills, but found no trace of the little girl. Authorities feared the worst. Anthonette had been kidnapped. As the days stretched into weeks and the weeks into months, police could offer little hope of ever finding Antoinette alive. But after a year went by, a surprise phone call seemed to indicate that she was alive and being held against her will. The call came into the Gallup Police Station. Before the girl could answer, the call was abruptly ended by a man. Hello? Antoinette, where are you? Antoinette? Hello? I listened to that tape over and over and over. And just by the way she says her last name and the way she screamed sent chills all over my body. Because a mother knows, and I know, that was her. She knew that was her daughter's voice on that tape, and she just couldn't figure out who the male's voice was in the background and where Antoinette was at. Okay, whereabouts in Albuquerque? Antoinette had indicated that she was in Albuquerque but the call was so short that it, it couldn't even be traced as to what line it was coming from. The phone call renewed hope of finding Anthonette. But four more years passed without any further clues. A possible sighting of Anthonette was reported in Carson City, Nevada, 870 miles from Gallup. A uh, waitress at a restaurant in Carson City told the uh, Carson City police about a strange incident that she had uh, witnessed that particular day. Okay, three cheeseburgers. She waited on a table at which sat a male and a female, rather unkempt, and a, a small girl about the age of 14 or 15. The little girl would deliberately drop a utensil on the floor. The waitress put the utensil back on the table and the little girl grabbed her hand. I'll get you another fork. And the waitress thought nothing of it and went about her business. The 
threesome left the restaurant and the waitress went and back to the table and began to bust the table. She lifted up the plate belonging to the girl and underneath was a napkin that said, please help me call the police. By the time she realized what had happened, the couple and the girl were gone. One month after the Carson City sighting, detectives re-interviewed Antoinette's younger sister, Wendy, who was five years old when Antoinette disappeared. We went to Wendy's school with the intention of just talking to her about what her recollections were of that particular night. There was a knock at the door. Anthony went to go answer, and then I followed her. Who's there? Open up. Who's there? Uncle Joe. Open up. She goes, who is that? And then they say, Uncle Joe. So she opened the door, and they grabbed her. She started kicking, and she goes, let me go, let me go. And then they took her to a van, a brown van. Wendy, why didn't you tell anybody about what you saw that night? Because I thought, since my mom was crying and everything, I thought I'd get in trouble. I don't believe she's making this up. I, I strongly feel that she's telling us the truth with that. Wendy was unable to provide investigators with a description of the kidnappers. Authorities interviewed Anthony's Uncle Joe, who provided a credible alibi for that night. He was quickly cleared as a suspect. I believe that the people that took Antoinette are not family members, but is somebody that is close to the family. Otherwise, Antoinette would not have opened that door had they not stated that it was her Uncle Joe. Finally, Penny visited a respected Navajo medicine woman. She performed the crystal ritual, which is said to make contact with the spirit of a missing person. The medicine woman said that Antoinette was still alive and may have a child. She was being held against her will by threats of violence somewhere in the Southwest. Going to the medicine lady gives me a lot of strength and it helps me to just know that she is alive. No matter who she's with, they got to have some compassion not to hurt another human being, as small as she is. Antoinette Cayadito was nine years old when she disappeared. Today, she would be in her 30s and may look like this computer-aged photo. She has brown hair and brown eyes, and her birthday is December 25th. If you have any information, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, Jeffrey McDonald says that intruders murdered his family. Authorities say that he's the killer. Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Just before dawn, MPs rushed to the home of Green Beret Captain Jeffrey McDonald in response to his call for help. They find Jeffrey in the bedroom, bleeding from cuts and stab wounds. His wife, who was five months pregnant, and their two young daughters have been savagely murdered. You gotta tell me what happened here, who did this to you? Jeffrey says that he and his family were attacked by four intruders, one of whom was a female. MPs reported seeing a woman that fit Jeffrey's description just two blocks from the murder scene. It is believed that the mystery woman was Helena Stokely, a known drug user and police informant. In 1982, she admitted that she had been present when her friends killed Jeffrey McDonald's wife and children. If this is true, then why is Jeffrey McDonald in prison serving three life sentences for murders that he says he did not commit. If the FBI or someone would check up on this, they would find out that Jeffrey McDonald is an innocent man. The evidence looked at by any neutral person 
points unerringly one way, and that's towards Helena Stokely and the group of outside assailants. The evidence suggests powerfully that only one person was responsible for these horrible deaths, and that is McDonald. The prosecution maintains that Helena Stokely was a drug addict who made up her story. Jeffrey McDonald and his defense team claim that important evidence was withheld, which backed up Stokely's account. Is Jeffrey McDonald innocent or guilty? Jeffrey and Colette McDonald were high school sweethearts from Long Island, New York. They got married during McDonald's junior year at Princeton, and seven months later, they had a baby girl, Kimberly. By the time Jeffrey McDonald had worked his way through medical school, they had a second daughter, Kristen. Medical school and parenthood had been tough on both Jeffrey and Colette. McDonald says that when he chose to join the Army, it turned out to be just the break they needed. Jeffrey joined the Army Green Berets as a surgeon. His wife and two daughters followed him to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Two a.m., the night of the murders. Colette and the girls had been asleep for hours, and Jeffrey was getting ready to go to bed. What you are about to see is Jeffrey's version of the events of that night. My youngest daughter, Kristen, had gotten in the master bedroom bed. Chrissy, come on, baby, let's wake up. And she had wet my side of the bed. I sleep on the couch. Come on. So I put her back in her own bed, then got an extra blanket, an afghan, as it were, and uh, went out to sleep on the living room couch. Uh, the next thing I remember was I was awakened and I heard Colette screaming and I heard Kimberly screaming and I saw three people. I saw a black male and I saw two white males. The black male swung something at me and I threw my hand up trying to ward off a blow. And something hit me in the forearm and my head and knocked me back onto the couch. The two white males started throwing what I thought were punches. I got a sudden sharp pain in my right chest, and I, I remember very distinctly thinking to myself, he throws a hell of a punch. During this time, I saw what I took to be a woman. I saw long stringy blonde hair, a big floppy hat, and I saw a wavering light on her face. I heard a voice that I thought was a woman's voice saying, acid is groovy, kill the pigs. I was grabbing arms and trying to hold on, and I couldn't grab because somehow my pajama top had been pulled over my head, and it was wrapped around my hands and my wrists, and I was trying to fend these people off. Colette. Colette. I went down the hallway and found her in the master bedroom. Colette. It was an awful sight. I started to give her mouth to mouth. And the air was coming out of her chest. Colette could not be revived. Jeffrey claims he gave up and covered her with his pajama top. Oh, Kimmy. Kimmy, baby. I ran into Kimberly's room. She was also covered with blood. She was in her bed. And I remember doing mouth to mouth on Kimberly. And I remember air coming out of her neck. And I went across the hall to check Kristen. And Kristen was the same way. And the next thing I remember was talking on the telephone, trying to get help. Jeffrey remembers telling the operator, we've been stabbed, we need help. But he could not make her understand. He dropped the phone. I remember a little later, standing in the bathroom, looking at my forehead because my head was splitting. It felt like my head was splitting. I, I couldn't think. I, could, I couldn't figure out what I was looking at. Then I remember washing my hands. I don't know why I was washing my hands. I'm a physician. I guess I was trying to do something surgical. Three minutes later, Jeffrey picked up the telephone. The operator was still on the line. <laughs> Yes, sir. Come on. Come on. Hold on. I don't even remember leaving the phone. The next thing I remember was a military policeman giving me mouth to mouth. I've got somebody on the way. I'm going to take care of you. You just got to hold on to me. 
he was unconscious. When we By daybreak, him. the crime scene was swarming with military police and agents of the Army's Criminal Investigation Division. According to Jeffrey, the Army investigators did not preserve the crime scene and may have destroyed critical evidence. It wasn't a controlled crime scene. At one point, the patrol supervisor instructed one of the MPs to go through and open the front door so that the ambulance drivers could bring the stretches in through the front of the house, through the living room where McDonald's said he had struggled with the three guys on a the couch. There was no chaos there at the crime scene. Former CID Special Agent William Ivory does undercover work and has asked that his features be concealed. There were military policemen who had never encountered uh, a crime scene like that, had never seen a dead body before, but it was not chaotic. As soon as I got there and got with the duty officer, we established control over the crime scene, and from that point on, it was orderly. The Army investigators say they collected evidence from all over the house and yard and quickly began to suspect that the crime scene had been faked. In the living room where Jeffrey said he'd fought three men, Army investigators say only a flower pot and a coffee table were overturned. They were surprised that so many weapons had been left behind. They found a knife in the master bedroom where the word pig had been written in Colette's blood. Have these been photographed? No, sir, they have. Another knife, an ice pick, and a two-by-two -two board were found outside. The knife and the ice pick had been wiped clean. All the weapons had come from inside the house. Finally, the Army viewed Jeffrey's injuries as relatively minor. A punctured lung, at least one bruise on his forehead, a slash on his stomach, and several stab wounds on his upper body. At the beginning, we just thought well, maybe he didn't have his story straight. That, that we got the story wrong. We sent other investigators to the hospital to speak to him, and he told them the same story. And we just could not reconcile what he said with what we were finding at the crime scene. Six months after the killings, the Army charged Jeffrey McDonald with the murders of his wife and his children. After four months of testimony, the military court concluded that the charges were not true. They suggested the Army investigate a woman named Helena Stokely, who had been seen near the McDonald House on the night of the murders. All charges against Jeffrey McDonald were dropped. At that time, we were thinking, why did I even have to have been put through that? Didn't the CID do any investigation before they charged people? That was our reaction. We were angry. But McDonald's troubles were far from over. Coming up, the FBI opens a new investigation and Jeffrey McDonald goes on trial for murder. In February 1970, the pregnant wife and two young daughters of Army Surgeon Jeffrey McDonald were brutally murdered in the family's Fort Bragg, North Carolina home. Although Army investigators charged McDonald with the murders, they weren't able to convince a military court of his guilt. But the crime scene itself was left intact, boarded up and preserved in its entirety. With the charges dropped, McDonald left the service. He went to work as an emergency room doctor in Long Beach, California. Five years passed, during which the FBI made a detailed study of McDonald's house they developed a scenario which showed how McDonald killed his family. Their theory was based on the location of each family member's blood in the house. Prosecuting attorney James Blackburn has formed a vivid and elaborate hypothesis of the events of that night. He believes it might have begun with a simple argument about Kristen's bedwetting. I'm not going to have that child sleep in this bed one more night. Keep it down. The kids are sleeping. Well, I need my sleep, too, and I'm not going to sleep in a wet bed every baby night. For Don't Christ. worry. I've already taken oh, care of it. Oh, you're such a tough guy. Oh. I think he flew into a rage, and he clubbed her with the piece of ash wood. Jeffrey! Blood from her blood type were found sprayed across the ceiling. She does not die from the injuries to the club. While he is doing this, 
she screams out. Kimberly, his oldest daughter, walks to the bedroom screaming, Daddy. As she walks to the door, she is hit in the face with the club. Her blood type is found at the entrance to the door. He picks her up. He takes her into her room. He clubs her again. Her blood type is found sprayed on the wall. He stamps her, he lays her in her bed, and he tucks her in. Colette has gotten up and gone in to protect her littlest daughter, Kristen. No, Jim, no! Colette is clubbed again and again on Kristen's bed. The reason we know Colette was in Kristen's room is because her blood type is found massively in there. Colette is carried back into the master bedroom, thrown on the floor. She is stabbed with an ice pick, and she is stabbed with a knife. She dies from bleeding to death. Kristen, the littlest girl, is stabbed in excess of 30 times with an ice pick and a knife. Blackburn theorizes that Jeffrey made it look like intruders had been in the house. He then went into the bathroom. A lot of blood is found in the bathroom sink. But the blood is not the blood of his family. The blood is that of his own self. It's type B blood. I believe that the blood got there when he self-inflicted his own injury to his right lung. At the hearing, a grand jury indicted Jeffrey McDonald for murder. But the case didn't go to trial until nine years after the killings. During that time, McDonald's chief defense attorney repeatedly tried to gain access to the prosecution's evidence, but all of his requests were denied. The government blocked us in every way. They sat on the evidence for nine years and fought all efforts for the defense to see it. Finally, with a few weeks to go before trial, I implored the judge in the name of fairness and decency to force the government to let us see it. The judge granted Siegel's request. Nine years worth of evidence have been boxed up and stored in a jail cell. There's no way, Bernie. This could take months. It could take years to do this. Siegel had only two weeks to examine thousands of exhibits, a task he knew was impossible. What are you doing now? I hear Kimmy screaming, Daddy, Daddy. Before the trial began, Siegel had Jeffrey put under hypnosis and videotaped the I'll, session. I'll help you. Just let it come up. That's fine. I'll help you, Kimmy. Jeffrey described in detail the four attackers. One of those descriptions seemed to match that of a woman seen by an MP on the night of the murders. Many believe the woman was drug addict and police informant, Helena Stokely. The evidence that we had was of nine separate people under different circumstances, different places, and different times who had heard from her own mouth her words admitting involvement in the murders of the McDonald family. During the trial, the defense subpoenaed Stokely to testify, even though the CID had dismissed her as a drug addicted liar. Do you remember in the On the stand, she did nothing to dispel that depiction. Do you recall talking to him about the McDonald murders at Fort Bragg? The subject came up, but I don't remember what we said. I was not surprised that Helena Stokely claimed that she didn't remember where she was on February the 17th. The reason I wasn't surprised is that in the one interview I had had with her before we put her on the stand, she kept saying that if she was given immunity from prosecution, she would tell what happened. But she was not offered immunity by the government. The government was not interested in hearing the truth, and they were certainly not interested in having the defense call a witness who could tell the whole story of how the murders were committed and how McDonald had been attacked. Here we have a girl. The judge ruled that testimony from the other witnesses who had heard Stokely's confession would be hearsay and therefore inadmissible as evidence. Call your next witness. The decision left the defense severely damaged. The prosecution continued to say that there was no evidence of intruders and overwhelming evidence that Jeffrey made up his story. The physical evidence demonstrates, I think, quite conclusively that McDonald is lying. 
Well, what, what they did was they took my memory of that night and then they searched very hard for any so-called forensic scientific fact from the crime scene that didn't fit my memory. And then if I couldn't explain their so-called forensic fact, they said, aha, if what you're telling us is true, you should be able to explain it. And since you can't, you must be guilty. You can throw the whole shooting match away, except for two pieces of evidence. In his summation, Blackburn emphasized two fibers from Jeffrey's pajama top that were found on the board used to kill Colette and Kimberly. According to the prosecution, that proved that Jeffrey was the killer. The jury agreed. Jeffrey McDonald was convicted on three counts of murder and received three consecutive life sentences. Next, evidence the jury never heard and the woman who claimed she witnessed the murders. For over three decades, Jeffrey McDonald has insisted that his family was murdered by intruders, but his lawyers had no way to prove it. The defense received 10,000 pages of documents related to the Jeffrey McDonald case. They were stunned to discover that the prosecution had evidence that intruders did invade the McDonald house, evidence that the defense never even knew existed. The key items that authorities recovered from the crime scene were human hairs and artificial fibers. Authorities learned that a hair they recovered from Colette's hand did not come from any member of the McDonald family. They found two blonde synthetic hairs of the type commonly used in wigs. These didn't match anything in the McDonald house. Most important to the defense were five black wool fibers. Some were found on Colette's body. The others were found on the club that killed her. Blue fibers from Jeffrey McDonald's pajama top were also recovered from the club. McDonald's story from the beginning was that he was attacked by the club. Naturally, his pajama fibers are found on the club. He was attacked by it. Also on the club was black wool that matched the black wool in Colette's mouth and on her bicep. McDonald didn't own black wool clothing. There was none found in the McDonald household. Who was wearing black wool that also had that club in his hand? That's the murderer. From the start, Jeffrey's defense team was convinced that Helena Stokely knew who the murderer was. At the time of the killings in 1970, Stokely was heavily involved in the Fayetteville drug scene. Catch you later, man. Helena Stokely was the main informant for former narcotics investigator Prince Beasley. Through her, he made hundreds of drug-related arrests. Helena trusted me with everything. She never let me wrong. She was always truthful, very truthful. Stokely once told Beasley that she belonged to a cult that practiced witchcraft and animal sacrifice. She, her boyfriend Greg Mitchell, and other members of the group used opium and heroin. I met Dr. McDonald several weeks before the McDonald murders at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. What do we got? We got an overdose. According to Stokely, one member of the group had overdosed on heroin and was taken to the emergency room at Cape Fear Valley Hospital. Who are those people? Jeffrey was the doctor on duty. Helena said that her group suspected McDonald was turning in drug users to the police. We simply discussed the fact that he was giving us a hard time and that someone did have to have a talk with him and they were just gonna rough him up a little or something like that. That evening I was wearing a blonde wig as a joke that belonged to my roommate and a floppy hat. I had on a black skirt and boots. At midnight, I took a hit of mescaline, and some people came by to pick me up, and we went out to Fort Bragg to talk to him. We got out to the house and uh, went walking around the back, got in after jimmying the lock. 
We went walking inside and Dr. McDonald was laying down on the couch. The TV was on, but it was off the air. I just screamed, acid is groovy. Kill the pigs, hit him again. Then someone went into the bedroom. Colette was laying there with one baby next to her. Greg Mitchell was in the bedroom then. Then I went back there and he was beating her up and I just started screaming, it's getting out of hand. From the start, the Army investigators discounted Stokely's story as unreliable. However, one person backs up her account. He says that he spoke to a woman inside the McDonald house around the time the killings took place. Stokely said she was that woman. Hello? Sometime after 2 a.m., Jimmy Fryer, an outpatient at a hospital clinic, was trying to reach a Dr. Richard McDonald. The hospital gave him Jeffrey McDonald's number by mistake. He asked for Dr. McDonald, and I just started laughing. And they said, hang up the phone. I'd like to know if she was drunk or could have been high or whatever, I don't know. There was definitely people in the background. And then a voice, a male voice behind said, hang up the damn phone. The phone went dead. I don't know if it was stacked side of the wall or hung up or that's, that's all I know. Approximately two hours later, Sergeant Kenneth Micah was responding to Jeffrey's call for help. He remembers seeing a woman with long hair and a floppy hat standing alone on a street corner two blocks from the McDonald house. Moments later, Jeffrey would describe a similar woman. The description also rang a bell with Prince Beasley. The day after the murders, he questioned Stokely. You guys match the description of the people McDonald says were in his house. She said it seemed like that I was there. And uh, she said all that blood, but I just couldn't stand it. She told me that she saw Greg Mitchell sitting on top of Colette McDonald, stabbing her with a knife. Helena Stokely died in 1983, but not before she told at least nine other people of her involvement in the McDonald killings. Helena's boyfriend, Greg Mitchell, also confessed to several people before his death, including his closest friend, Bryant Lane. He said, we came down there to teach him a lesson and to whip his family. But man, he said, things went bad. He said, Bryant, he said, we killed the McDonald family. He said, we didn't mean to. And Jeffrey McDonald is sitting in jail right now for a crime that he did not commit. Jeffrey's defense team appealed his conviction based on the new fiber and hair evidence but the court said it was too late to present it, since the evidence had been available all along. The case has been appealed to the Supreme Court more than any other in U.S. history, but Jeffrey McDonald's conviction has always been upheld. He was denied parole in 2005. His next parole hearing isn't until 2020. I believe that Jeffrey McDonald alone is the one who's responsible for these murders. And I think Jeffrey McDonald alone is the one person who ought to be in prison for as long as possible for having committed these murders. I know that I'm innocent. I never injured my family. I didn't participate in it. And I certainly didn't kill him. I will win this case someday, somehow. The truth cannot be kept hidden forever. It just simply can't be. Somehow, my vindication will happen. Next, a woman tries to visit her baby's grave, but discovers it doesn't exist. Could her baby be alive? Worthington, Minnesota. Marlis Gross is 20 years old, soon to be divorced and about to give birth. She has moved to Minnesota to be near her mother when the baby is born. Marlis is heavily sedated during her difficult labor. The next thing she remembers 
is seeing her daughter, Mary Agnes Gross, for the first time. I couldn't take my eyes off of her little feet. They were moving, and I felt so happy. And I just kept watching her little feet, and then I drifted back to sleep. When I woke up, I looked to see where my baby was, and I didn't see her. And I asked the nurse, where's my baby? And she said, the doctor will be in to talk to you. Can I see my baby now? I'm sorry, Marlis, but your baby died. How long did my baby live? Just one hour. <laughs> I could hardly believe that, you know, because I seen her little feet move. When Marlis left the delivery room, she passed a bassinet that was on its way to the morgue. She insisted on seeing her baby. And I must have only seen my daughter maybe 10 seconds, 15 at the most. And my baby didn't look dead. My baby looked like she was just sleeping. She wasn't purple. She had dark hair. She had lots of hair. She also noticed that Mary Agnes had marks on her forehead left by the doctor's forceps during the delivery. She asked for an autopsy, but was told that it was too late. When Marlis was still in the hospital, a friend visited the funeral home along with Marlis's mother. She claimed that the baby she saw looked different from the infant that Marlis had described. I didn't see any marks on her forehead. Her hair was light brown, not dark brown, and not a whole lot of it. It was, it looked, you know, kind of downy-like, I suppose. When Marlis's mother tried to take a picture of the baby, the funeral director would not allow it. This is for my daughter. I know. You can take one at the cemetery after the, after the casket's been closed. Later, Marlis's mother took these pictures of the casket at the cemetery. The funeral took place while Marlis was still in the hospital. Afterwards, her mother said that something strange had happened. There had been another family at the gravesite, another family that was mourning for Mary Agnes. And they took it so hard, and they prayed and prayed, and they had tears. I could never figure out who those people were. My mother never could figure out who those people were. A week after the funeral, Marlis was well enough to visit her daughter's grave. I took it so hard, just so bad. And from that day on, I was out to that cemetery like three, four times a week. Three months later, Marlis received a mysterious photograph in the mail. There was no letter, no return address, just a picture of a husband, a wife, and three children. One of them, a baby girl. The baby looked like my husband, and I've never seen these people in my life. And I showed it to my family, and my family didn't know who those people were either, but they also thought the baby looked a lot like my husband. A year passed before Marlis saved enough money to buy a headstone. But cemetery workers did not place the stone on top of Mary Agnes's grave. Instead, it was positioned a few feet off to the side. Though she moved away, Marlis would still make trips to her daughter's grave. On one visit, she got the shock of her life. A headstone for a different baby had been placed on Mary Agnes's burial plot. The baby's name was Pamela Ray Dickey. Marlis immediately questioned the funeral director. I says, this can't be. I even bought a stone and laid it out there. And then right away, he said, I often wonder what that stone was doing out there, because there never was a grave. And I says, well, I know they laid it on the wrong spot at that time. Well, he says, no, he says, your daughter's not buried out here. Marlis discovered that Pamela Dickey had died only a few hours before Mary Agnes on the same day in the same hospital. Both were buried on the same day. There was not two funerals out there that day. There was only one funeral, one grave. Marlis also found Mary Agnes's last name, Gross, written in the upper corner of one of Pamela Dickey's funeral papers. Even more puzzling, hospital records say Mary Agnes was healthy at birth, 
but the death certificate said she was stillborn. The birth certificate said that she was born at 6.23 p.m. The death certificate said that she died three minutes before she was born at 6.20. Every place that I go and check this out, the papers just, just like my daughter had never died. Marlis asked that her daughter's body be exhumed. DNA testing revealed that the child buried there was not Mary Agnes. Marlis then showed Pamela's mother the photos taken of Mary Agnes's casket. She looks at the picture, she says, that's my baby. My husband bought that casket. And then I asked her, I said, did anyone go to your baby's funeral? She said, yes, my in-laws and my husband. I believe that my mother now went to the Pamela Ray Dickey's funeral. If Marlis is right, Pamela Dickey is buried where she thought her own daughter was laid to rest. So what happened to Mary Agnes? Marlis is convinced that she's still alive and that the baby in the picture she received more than 30 years ago was her firstborn daughter. But I think today that picture was, was a family that adopted my baby and they wanted to show me that my baby was in a family and that's why they sent me that picture. I was 20 years old, I lived by myself, and maybe they thought that I couldn't take care of the baby, so they had another family raise my baby. Marla still hopes to find out what happened to her daughter. Mary Agnes was born on June 12, 1962, at Worthington Regional Hospital in Worthington, Minnesota. I'll never give up, never give up until I find where she's at. If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com.